Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 12. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And as they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, he and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. When the chief priests and scribes heard it, and they were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. And as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stay praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. This is God's word. Please be seated. Before we go to God's word, I'd like to open us, uh, open our hearts in prayer. Uh, today is the day that we remember our brothers and sisters around the world uh, who are in the persecuted church, and we want to remember them in prayer as well. Let me pray, and pray with me in your hearts. Heavenly Father, most gracious and merciful God, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, and Holy Spirit, our Comforter, we pray to you today as we come to the Word, work in us that which is truly pleasing in your sight. May the burden that we carry in this life be lifted and light because we embrace your burden. And we want to pray today for the burden that rests upon our brothers and sisters all over the world in countries where Christians are persecuted for the sake of your son, Jesus. Those who are disallowed to attend church, those who actually are imprisoned and also put to death because of their faith in you. For those who have been brave enough to say that they will never renounce you, Lord Jesus, we pray Comfort them, not just this day, but every day of the week and every Sunday in which they seek to gather. We pray, protect them. May your hand be upon them. May their lives lived out graciously in front of their enemies. Bring many to know you and trust you because your goodness is so evident in their lives and in their graciousness. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that we who live in freedom and safety will not forget them, but lift them up in our prayers continually before you. And we pray now, Lord Jesus, work in us and through us through this word today from your messenger, Mark. For we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. So as we look at the passage today, uh, you may have noticed it's a little odd and a little difficult to think about. Jesus actually cursing something, and it actually happened. This is the only anti-miracle in the Bible, if you want to call it that, where Jesus says something and uh, what we would consider bad comes out of it. 
So the context, though, here is very, very important. These accounts happen back to back for a very specific reason during Holy Week. And so we have to be careful because Jesus points to something that we all know but we often forget, is that things are not always what they seem. That often what we see with our eyes does not betray what is actually behind it and that we have to look carefully. And so uh, I was reading a story, a blog post on the internet recently. I thought it fit well into here. It was from a, a young mother. She's talking about being at a Target store and this is what she observed in front of her. She said, there are two lines in the transactions before me, and I recognize siblings of one of my kids from school. They were there, and somebody who seemed to be their grandmother also was there, and they had a lot of toys. There were Lego sets and Nerf guns and games and a basketball and a doll and a Rubik's Cube, and I was standing trying to discreetly see everything that was in the basket there, and I thought, wow, a lot of stuff must be nice to have a generous grandmother like that. I, was prob I also probably thought the kids were pretty lucky to go on a shopping spree, and yes, I thought they were spoiled. I left and thought nothing about it until a week later. I learned that those same kids I'd seen in Target had recently dealt with a flood in their home and lost everything. And here, I was thinking it was their, maybe their rich grandmother indulging them, and instead she was just trying to replace a few of their favorite toys, or maybe she was letting them pick out something new to get excited about to make some of the hurt go her way, but probably she was just trying to get their life back to a little bit of normal. Most of those things are replaceable, and I felt like a jerk for judging and thinking anything about it. But it reminded me again that things are not always as they seem. There are two aspects of this story that are not as they seem. We see the fig tree, which looks fruitful. It's all leaved out. It's beautiful and gorgeous, but it's actually not fruitful at all. And you see this great, huge edifice of the temple. That's beautiful and beyond glory. And you think, I can go there and meet with God. And you really can't. And what you see here is the story at itself, at first glance, seems to be a random act by Jesus to use his power to destroy something for no conceivable purpose. But that's not true either. Our task today is to understand how these events are strung together and why Jesus does what he does. In other words, there's a reason behind this strange story of Jesus, and there's a reason why this fig tree story bookends Jesus cleansing the temple. And so we'll look at that as we go through. But what you need to see is that this is kind of a, a visual parable. That what Jesus is doing is you're He's laying out something for his disciples, and we're being told a story that has actually a deeper meaning than what you first see. And that leads us to our first point in our text. If you want to look on your bulletin, the first point is the parable of the fig tree. In other words, a hope for fruitfulness. Let's look at verses 11 through 14 again. So it says here, on the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season of figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So let me elucidate a couple of facts about fig trees. So the fig tree in view here is not a bush, it's a tree. Uh, they can grow 20 to 30 feet in height. Their trunk can get as large as three feet in diameter, and the leaves and branches can spread out 25 to 30 feet. In other words, fig trees are big trees. All right? Fig trees are unusual in that they can produce as many as three crops of figs a year. So the first crop is produced on the old wood. So early in the year, green knobs or buds appear at the end of the branches, and they're called pagim. 
And while this fruit is not as juicy and as rich as the later fruit, it's still edible and it's still good for you. After the pagim appear, the fig tree will begin to grow its leaves and new growth because the fig tree is kind of unique in that regard in that it can be full of fruit, full of leaves, and full of blooms all at the same time. So it's important to know that although the full ripe figs would not be ready until June, and it's now March, remember, it's Passover time, these pagim, these little knobs, are actually edible. And Jesus was probably looking for those. He comes to the tree. He finds none. There's no early pagim, and that means that there's also not going to be any fruit in June. Although this tree looks like it should be amazingly fruitful, there should be plenty to eat there, with all of its leaves out, it's actually completely barren. You know, <clears throat> Jesus surprises us by his humanity sometimes, doesn't he? He gets hungry. He seems unaware of the fig tree's fruitfulness. I mean, he could have easily caused the tree to produce fruit, or he could have turned the leaves into fruit or whatever. He stopped storms. He produced bread. He generated fish. He regenerated even dead people. It's not a stretch to think that Jesus could produce something to eat or revitalize this tree. But he has other ideas about what to do here in order to teach his disciples and to teach us. Something really important about fig trees and about Christian living. Fig trees are about fruitfulness. Okay? Fig trees are created to be fruitful. They are created to gather from the environment, the water from the ground, the air and oxygen, and bring it together and suck it up and pull it out in its beautiful sweetness into this piece of fruit. That's what they're meant to do. And unfortunately, this tree is and always will be a disappointment when it comes to fruitfulness. It can't, it won't produce fruit. I think we all desire, I think we all have a deep desire within us to be fruitful. I think it might be buried under ambition or it might be broken by failure and hopelessness, but I think every single one of us wants to make a difference. Every single one of us wants to have an impact. Every single one of us wants to produce a good, a sweetness, that, in, that impacts the people and the society around us. We all want to be fruitful. At least I hope we do. I mean, if you don't want to be fruitful, that's another conversation for another time, and we need to have it. Now, the fig tree has a significance in the process of fruitfulness. If you read through your Old Testament, you'll find lots of references to the fig tree. And they'll, they'll, they'll go one of two ways. Fig tree was either a sign of blessing or a sign of cursing. They actually have an, eschatolog an eschatological flavor to them. So, for example, in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25, it says in terms of making a, a blanket statement about Solomon's reign, this is what it says, and Judah and Israel lived in safety from Dan to Beersheba, from the north to the south. Every man under his vine... <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, and under his fig tree, all of the days of Solomon. The fig tree represents the sweet life, the life of blessing when you follow God. When you follow God, your fig tree blossoms and produces gl glorious fruit each year. Life is good. That's what it stands for. And you see that repeated over and over again in the Old Testament. Well, what happens when you don't follow God? Joel chapter 1, verse 12. This is what he says is going to happen to God's people because they don't follow God. The vine will dry up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple. All the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of men. So what Joel predicts is going to happen is that God's people who've abandoned their God, that the environment and the crops are going to languish. They're going to dry up. 
that life, instead of being sweet and bountiful, will become bitter and dry. So let's summarize this for a moment. What does the picture of the fig tree mean? It means God has created every single one of us to be fruitful. That's what he's saying. God has created us to, in his image, to mimic those attributes of him that are called communicable attributes, the ones that make us look like God or like Jesus. Beauty, generosity, kindness, compassion, creativity, all of the glorious communicable attributes of God are poured out upon us so that we would be fruitful in a glorious good in obedience. What this also means, though, is that we often fail in being fruitful. Instead of producing the fruit of righteousness, we instead produce nothing. And in our attempt to produce righteousness, we just produce a show of righteousness. We look like the fig tree, lots of leaves, but no fruit. Outwardly, we look pretty decently. Inwardly, we're corrupt. It's a mirage. If you look closely enough, you will see that we're just a mirage. We're a fake. We're full of hypocrisy. You know that God intends for you to be fruitful. That's his desire for you. He wants you to be fruitful in every aspect of your life. He doesn't expect us uh, as older people to come to the end of our lives and be old and crotchety. He actually expects us to grow and mature and increase more and more in our ability to love and to be truthful in love. And God expects us as young, younger people to be fruitful, to have intention in our life, not just to live for ourselves and our own pleasure and our own comfort, to be addicted to our own selves, but to be energized at what it takes to get out into our world and live like the kingdom of God. He wants us to make a difference and put energy and time into seeing that we can put our lives into a good and godly purpose. He desires for us to know the kingdom of Jesus Christ and give it to the world around us. That's what God desires for us. That's what the parable of the fig tree is all about. It's about fruitfulness. That leads us to our second point. So why the divine judgment? It's because a divine pruning, this is our second point, a divine pruning and judgment is for the sake of fruitfulness. Look at verses 15 and 16 again. It says, and they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. So what Jesus is describing here is that right after he sees the fig tree in all of its glory with no fruit on it, it's not fruitful, he goes to the temple. And imagine yourself going into Jerusalem and you go up to the Temple Mount. You see this huge, beautiful, amazing edifice supposedly to the worship of God. And you go inside expecting to meet God. And what you meet is a bunch of sheep, a bunch of money changers. There's all kinds of noise and craziness going on. You go up to the table to exchange your Roman currency for the for the necessary temple tax, and you get charged like five times what it should be. And so by the time you actually get to the place where you can pray, it's kind of like getting a mortgage on your house. You're so exhausted, you can't even, exp you can't even enjoy the mortgage, the new house you just bought. Well, the bank bought for you. <clears throat> so that's what's happening. And Jesus wants his disciples to see that the fig tree with no fruitfulness is the same thing that they're seeing in the temple with no prayer. 
What does Jesus say about it? Verse 17, and he was teaching them, saying, it is, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So Jesus quotes from two Old Testament passages here, Isaiah 56, where God made the promise that his temple would be a place for prayer for all the nations, that all could come and pray. And that actually echoes Solomon in uh, 1 Kings see where that is. It's actually uh, 2 Chronicles <clears throat> chapter 6 where Solomon dedicates the temple and he calls anybody who wants to meet with God and pray to come to the temple and they could call to God and God would listen. So Jesus is simply reiterating what the temple is meant to be. And he says, but you have made it a den of robbers. And there he quotes from Jeremiah 7 where Jeremiah declares that the temple is now a place for robbers to find safety and not the people of God. And he accuses the people of liking it that way. They are okay with it being a den of robbers. And that's exactly what Jesus sees every time he comes into the temple square, is he sees people making money off of those who want to come to God and making it impossible for them to do so. The temple has now become a place completely devoid of sweetness and the fruitfulness of the presence of God. And Jesus himself is beside himself that this is what's happened. And scholars think, you know, so Jesus made a circuit about every year, probably entered Jerusalem about every Passover time, some scholars believe that every time Jesus came to Jerusalem and entered the temple that he cleansed it. And so this is the third time and the Pharisees and the priests are done with it. No more. We're going to get rid of this guy. So I, I wonder how do we communicate the accessibility of God as a church? Do we make it seem that God, it's hard to access God? Do we make it seem like you have to know all of these things to access God? Do we make it look like you have to be a certain way to access God and dress a certain way and be in a certain socioeconomic or ethnic category to worship God? Or do we make it clear that it's ex God can be accessed by anyone, anywhere, who simply come. There are a couple of barriers I just want to list quickly. One of them is, uh, is, is what I'll call the prosperity gospel. It makes people think that accessing God is all about money and material things. It's like equating a new Jeep to Jesus that a new Jeep is like the best gift I could ever have. But there's no way a, je a Jeep can replace the eternal Son of God. It can't answer prayers. It can't forgive sins. It can't comfort sadness. It can't even drive you to heaven or anywhere close, for that matter, unless you get to Idaho with it. <clears throat> to even intimate that the beauty of God can be experienced only through a house or a new car is pure counterfeit Christianity and way too many people buy into it. But there's another side too, and that's called the barrier of legalism or Jesus plus something. You need Jesus plus this to know that you can access God. Jesus plus a better life or Jesus plus a job, or Jesus plus the right family, or Jesus plus religion. All kinds of religious things. But the truth is, it's Jesus plus nothing to access God. John Newton, who knew all about these kinds of things, one of our Puritan forefathers, said it this way. He said, I endeavored to renounce society. In other words, here's a guy who embraced all of society. You know, he was a drunkard. He was a slaver. He had everything that you could want in this life. And he said, I endeavored to renounce all that. I just, you know, to, that I might avoid temptation. But it was a poor religion. 
so far as it prevailed, only tended to make me gloomy, stupid, unsociable, and useless. Jesus plus something makes us gloomy, stupid, unsociable, and useless. Or you could substitute fruitless. Jesus plus nothing makes us fruitful. Which brings us to our last point in the text here. That Jesus then gives a call to his disciples to cultivate fruitfulness in prayer. Mark 11.20 says, As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away at its roots. And Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. So Peter is obviously the first to notice that something happened to the fig tree, that the fig tree is destroyed from its roots, as the Greek says. Now, although Jesus doesn't say anything, the meaning is clear. If the temple of God is fruitless, the same thing will happen to it. And it does, 40 years later. The temple of uh, on uh, Temple Mount is completely destroyed, taken down stone from stone. And it's replaced by God's people. P- God's people are now the house of living stones who are built into this new dwelling for the Holy Spirit. So scripture is pointing you to the secret of fruitfulness here. If you want to be fruitful in your life, This is the secret. That's where Jesus is going with this. The fruitfulness that God offers to us most is experienced through prayer. You see that connection? That that's where this whole passage has been going the whole time. We have a fake fruitful fig tree. We have a fake fruitful temple. And then Jesus invites us to truly pray that that is the pathway to fruitfulness. The way to access God and all that he intends for us in producing good in us, the sweetness of God and his spirit, comes from asking, seeking, knocking at the door of heaven, asking God to fill us with his sweet goodness like the fig tree in full season. Prayer is the key to fruitfulness. And I want you to notice that prayer has always been the key to fruitfulness. It's always been our communion with God that produces good in us. What was the purpose of the temple? It was to be a house of prayer. What was Jesus offering now that the temple is fruitless? He's offering a prayer of faith. One of the New Testament scholars in his New Testament theology says it this way. He says, the faith of Mark 11.23 is a faith that prays. Prayer is the source of its power and the means of its strengths. God's omnipotence is its sole assurance and God's sovereignty is its only restriction. Prayer is the key to fruitfulness. Now, I want you to notice where Jesus hinges prayer before he begins to sound like a genie, okay? He says, have faith in God. So everything about prayer is not about us or what we want, but it's about God and what God wants. Remember the Lord's Prayer in the very first uh, phrases of the Lord's Prayer, our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it all hinges upon the mind and the heart of God. That's what we pray for because that's what changes our hearts and begins to produce sweetness. Three things to keep in mind as application. One, Prayer is a matter of the mind. Notice verse 23. Jesus says, 
do not doubt. So the word diakrinos is an unusual Greek word to use here. It means to not know what you think, to be divided in your thoughts, to not understand exactly what's going on in your mind, or to not judge yourself correctly. You see, prayer is actually the means that we access not our mind, but the mind of God. And it helps us to know God's mind, what God thinks, where God is going. Prayer is knowing what's on God's heart and not being divided by what we don't know or even what we do know. Prayer is a matter of the mind. And one of the best things to do is to pray Scripture. You want to pray God's heart? Pray Scripture. Secondly, prayer is a matter of the heart. Notice he says, believe that you have received it. The word for belief here is pistio. It means to have confidence. It means to know certainly somewhere here in your being, the place that we call the heart, that God is going to answer according to his will. And so when we ask for his will, we know that he will do it. When we pray according to his will, we have that confidence And, you know, to put it bluntly, I mean, if you ask God, Lord, help me to be more kind. I think that that's a prayer that God would love to answer and will answer in your life. If you ask God, help me to be more compassionate, that God does that. That's the kind of prayer he answers. And for me, I had to like, uh, when, when we came back from our sabbatical three years ago, I had to repent and pray, God, I need to to speak truth more. I hide it. And God answered that prayer. That's where we become more fruitful and become more like the heart of God. Prayer is a matter of the heart. And prayer, finally, is a matter of our deepest desires. When we stand praying and seeking forgiveness, at the very heart of our prayer is this huge desire to be reconciled to God, to be one with God, to know God's heart and God's mind, to know his great compassion. And those deep desires well up within us and become fervent, beautiful, amazing prayers. So you can see how this passage is not what it first seems to be. A sort of trivial act on Jesus' part to curse a fig tree because he just didn't happen to get what he wanted. It actually is an unveiling of us, God's people, that often we prefer to look like a fig tree with no fruit. We prefer to kind of hide what's going on inside us that's bitter and dark And we cover it up with lots of fluffy religious leaves. We like to look good. But that isn't what God's about. I wonder if that's why we don't pray very often. Because we know that God will answer our prayers and he'll change us. But when he changes us through prayer, he makes us amazingly fruitful. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for these words. Thank you for leading us down this pathway towards fruitfulness. And I pray, Lord Jesus, by your power and grace at work within us, draw us into the sweetness, the glory, the wonder of prayer. For I pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.